story one. I was reminded of this story after a recent phone call from an old friend. It's rather a long one, so sincere apologies in advance. Some years ago, I got a gig working at a weekend music festival. It was fairly simple, 10 bands per day and all pretty standard rock and roll fare. The boss put four of us out on the gig, me, Dreadful Boris, Big Chris, and Hammer. He also said we'd be taking out an apprentice, a young lad who was the son of a local promoter. Well, it's always nice to have an extra pair of hands, and it's good to help train the next generation. After all, that's how we learned in the past. As it turned out, this lad was about as much use as an aqualung to a trout and had an entitled attitude the size of a mid-ranged African country. On the journey down in the truck, he was boasting about how he was a really good sound engineer already and that he could probably show us a few tricks. Oh, really? We get to the venue and get busy unloading the truck. We've got a 16-ton vehicle stuffed to the gills with two sound desks and about 16 kilowatts of sound gear for front of house and about 6 kilowatts of monitors. As you might imagine, this is pretty heavy stuff, and it takes all of us to safely unload it and get it stacked up in place. However, after unloading the first amp rack all on wheels but still around 80 kilos, the entitled brat snottily announces that I'm a sound engineer, not a humper, and promptly strolls off. Air. Okay. Well, we don't really need him gumming up the works. We're all well used to slinging boxes around. So about an hour later, we've got the rig stacked up and strapped down, run out the multicore to the front of house desk, and are ready to start cabling up and tying power into the on-site generator. Out of nowhere, the spotty oik emerges from whatever hole he had buried himself in and asks what he can do. I say, I'm going to plug up front of house. Perhaps you could help Hammer cable up the speakers. I don't take orders from girlies. Quick side note here. Hammer was 5'9", drop-dead gorgeous, and as hard as nails, hence her nickname. She was also a darn fine front-of-house engineer and a jolly good mate. Boris, Chris, and I collectively groaned inwardly and winced in anticipation of a full 16-inch broadside from Hammer seriously. Folks, you do not mess with her unless you want the family jewels dangling from the nearest tree. Instead, she smiles sweetly never a good sign and says, Well, I'm sure you'll learn something useful. I then go off to play with Cable's front of house, while Boris and Chris busy themselves with the monitors. A while later, I'm back on stage, Spotty Oik has wandered off again. Hammer has this resigned look on her face. What happened, I ask? Turns out that, despite cables and connector ports being well-labeled, the oik had managed to make a complete pig's ear of plugging up the amp racks. Trust me, it's very hard to make this kind of mistake. I found the oik some moments later and told him that it was not the proper way of doing things, and that if he wasn't sure what to do, he should always ask one of us beforehand. What then came out of his mouth absolutely floored me. I don't need to know all that rubbish. I'm a sound engineer. Blink. Hammer, who was standing a few feet away, snorted derisively and rolled her eyes heavenwards. It took me a few seconds to process this particular nugget of stupidity. Well, you have to know how all this works. It's part and parcel of the job. And as you're here to learn, I suggest you pay attention. Well, you're just a bunch of roadies. What do you know? Upon delivering this charming bonmont, he ambles off again, leaving me to retrieve my jaw from off the deck and hammer barely able to restrain a fit of laughter that would have incapacitated a rhino. At a guess, this idiot thought he was going to be white-gloving front of house for the whole gig. An hour or so later, we're all set up, and we now have a fair idea of the acts that are going to be performing. In situations like this, you rarely get the opportunity for a full-blown sound check, so you have to rely on experience to set the desk up from cold. Luckily, we got the first act on stage a half hour before the kickoff so I could quickly get a rough sense of the overall setup. A bit of exposition. It's convenient to reuse channels across acts, so I generally keep the first 20 or so channels for drums, bass, and guitars, and the last half dozen or so channels for vocals. If a band comes in with anything else, percussion, brass, Tibetan nose flutes, etc., we whack them on channels in the middle. This keeps things nice, simple, and consistent across the board, and becomes important in a moment. The working procedure in show is also simple. Dreadful Boris and Big Chris run the monitor desk, and Hammer and I run front of house. 
We'll do two acts each before handing over to the other saves wear and tear on the ears, and when we're not running the desk, we'll handle setting up the stage for each act and troubleshooting where necessary, as well as doing runs for food and coffee in between. We also tasked the spotty oik with helping with the stage setups, which rapidly proved problematic. We finished the first act and aimed to do the turnover within 15 minutes, Generally, the incoming act will tell us their mic requirements and will write up a mic plot which then gets sent up to the front of house desk. Up comes Spotty Oik with the mic plot, and he goes back to help with the stage setup. As I'm checking each mic, I notice that I cannot hear the vocal channels. No sooner had I spotted this than Dreadful Boris comes on the intercom and asks me if I can hear the vocal channels he can't hear them either. He then goes off to check the stage box where all the mics are plugged into. From all the way out front, I hear him shout, Oh my goodness! Seconds later, he's back on the cans. Do you know what that flipping idiot has done? Only repatched all the vocal channels so that all the plugs on the stage box are lined up neatly one after the other, his words. Boris rapidly repatches the mics, and we're good to go again. A few hours later, and I'm starting my second shift out front, I won't bore you with my experiences of riding herd on spotty oik on the stage shift, which, shall we say, was interesting. Currently on stage is a rather nice jazz septet, I love doing jazz. Give me a nice 20-piece big band, and I'm a happy bunny. Up strolls he who shall not be mentioned and asks, when can I have a go at mixing? I'm really good, you know? Seeing as he's here to learn, I tell him he can take the next act under my supervision. This happened to be an acoustic duo, two guitars and two vocals. Even the most Tyro engineer should be able to handle something so simple, right? Wrong. I've already set what I regarded as a sensible baseline on the faders for him to work with. First thing he does, he reaches for the master faders and cranks in another 15 decibels. No, immediately the rig teeters on the edge of feedback, and I rapidly pull the mains back. Look and listen, balance out the two vocals, then the guitars, leave the mains alone. He then starts making wildly inappropriate changes to the channel's equalization. Again, the rig starts to squeak. Okay, enough. I shove him out of the way and bring it back under control. I won't fatigue you further with the endless catalog of foul-ups and attitude that he managed to affect over the rest of the weekend. Suffice it to say that despite the best efforts of myself and Hammer to try and teach this guy, they all went to naught. Couple this with a constant drip 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 of snide commentary about how he was really a better engineer than the rest of us, and by the end of the weekend, we're all pretty annoyed. Come the end of the event, and it's now the fun part of striking the rig and loading out, I'm being sarcastic about the fun part. By the way, two solid days, and we're all exhausted, and the last thing we want to be doing is the get out, but of course, it has to be done. It's always an all hands on deck situation except the spotty oik has, once again, vanished into the woodwork. Two back-breaking hours later, and we're all done, and the truck loaded to go home. So where is the spotty oik? Nowhere. We give it a good 15 minutes, but no joy. We then decided to go look for him, so we spent another 20 minutes trolling around the site trying to find him. Again, he's done a disappearing act. We get back to the truck. It's now close to 3 a.m., and almost simultaneously we say, Forget him. We climb back aboard and drive the 250 miles back to the warehouse to unload. Next afternoon, the boss calls me to find out why we'd left the spotty oik behind. I gave him the cliff notes and was then told that the oik had had to call his dad at 3 in the morning to come and get him a 500-mile round trip. He then said, I never liked that promoter anyway. He was always late paying the bill on previous gigs. Next time he calls wanting a rig and crew. I think I'll tell him to take a hike. Story 2 I worked at a clothing store in a mall for a year and a half. It was not fun, but I was thinking back to my time there recently, and I forgot this golden gem of professional revenge. So a new girl had just been hired, as many new people did in that job, and right away you could tell she thought she was hot stuff. We're talking acting like a manager, talking about how many hours she had, and worst of all, she wouldn't shut up about all the men she was dating and how the money she got from them was the most important part. To put it lightly, she was a cold-hearted person who made everyone feel bad about their insignificant lives, as she put it. Here's where things go down. In our store, 
All the racks were milled steel bars and hooks, so really hard to break and really expensive. They could, however, be bent out of shape if enough heavy coats stay on them for long periods of time. Miss Hot here thought it would be a good idea to impress the management by putting all the coats on the same rack using the milled steel bars instead of a circular rack that wouldn't warp. I protested, of course, as I'd been there longer, but she said, I get paid more than you, so do what I say. She got hired as a key holder out of the gate, so she made a dollar more than I did per hour. I go along with it, put the heavy winter coats up on the milled steel and go about my life. Well, two weeks later, the milled steel was, of course, warped. And when management saw this, they flipped Cheapo's store. Any cost was bad to them. Anyway, she blames it on me, and I get written up for it. Now I refuse to sign, so they gave me fewer hours, which also cut my pay. Because she lied, I was now making 50% less than before and had a formal written complaint against me. To say I was ticked off wouldn't even start. So I devised a plan to get back at her. You see, the drywall on the center pillars had sustained water damage from an early melt earlier that year, making them extremely soft. However, they provide some of the largest coverage of shelf space in the entire store, meaning basically a good 20% of shelf space couldn't be used. Now the kicker is Miss Hot didn't know about this as she came in a week after it had happened. And to the naked eye, you wouldn't think the pillar couldn't be used as there were banners on it to try and hide the yellowing. I may have suggested what a waste not being able to have product on the pillars was and how someone could come up with a nice display that would bring in a lot of customers due to how people could see it from the mall main floor. We were just off the food court. Her eyes lit up. Now here's the thing. I was taking a small break to a nice snowy lake cabin the next day. And the people she had worked with were the manager or the temps who were not allowed to handle marketing and logistics that is putting shelves racks up on the wall due to their cost and the incident that got me written up. Now I knew she wouldn't want the managers to see it because she wanted all the glory from it. She wanted to show to our three stores in the mall that her store was the best while the managers weren't around. So she, being with a temp and them not being able to put up shelving, put the heavy winter clothing on milled steel racks attached to the soft drywall pillars. Within a week, the drywall on the pillars collapsed and ruined $500 worth of product. Now she tried to shift blame on me, but I was away for the whole week, so it could not have been me because obviously, that can't happen if I'm in the forest hundreds of miles from civilization. So no dice there, and she promptly got charged with the repair, demoted to sales associate, and written up for what they finally realized was not just this, but the one they wanted me to sign. The repair was $2,500 plus the $1.500 stock that got destroyed when 40 pounds of drywall came crashing down on it but I wasn't done yet. You see, our manager in our store specifically was pretty chill, and she's still a personal friend to me. She had a group chat so we could talk off hours and keep up to date. Now, as I mentioned before, she wouldn't shut up about all the men she was playing, and how the only thing that mattered was the money, and boy oh boy, did she use the group chat to say a lot of this? Sometimes one of these men would come around and take her for lunch. Let's just say when she was in the back for a little while finishing something up. I let them see the text channel if they promised not to let her know I told them. So often they'd go on their lunch date, and after one or two days, she'd be down a man. Finally, this boiled over when one of them took her phone, saw how many guys she had been dating for money, and messaged all of them about how much of a lying cheat she was. After two months, her fountain of man money dried up, and now demoted to a sales associate. She didn't have the money to spend on all her lavish nights out or designer clothing. She eventually moved up to another store for more hours and took money from the till, causing her to get fired. A fitting end to a backstabbing ice queen, I think. I eventually left that job after half a year later to pursue my current job.